I'm glad to see each of every one of you on holiday. Sometimes the uh, service is kind of deserted. I'm told by pastors in Minnesota because they only have two months out of the year where they got any daylight, uh, any good weather, that everybody leaves town by Friday night. So they have to move their Sunday services to Friday evening. Isn't that crazy? Anyway, so let me tell you, I'm very happy to see all of you here. Um, okay. What is this? Garbage bag. And what do we usually use it for? Garbage. But it's not the only use, right? How many of you guys saw a film recently where the garbage bag was put to an unusual use that some guys often do? What? Raincoat? Yeah, it makes a good raincoat. You get caught in an unexpected uh, storm, it's great. Kind of raincoat in reverse. A recent award-winning movie called um, Silver Lining Playbook, in which the hero you saw on the TV ads, he goes running around, not only in old-fashioned sweats, but he's wearing on top of his sweats a garbage bag. And they show that prominently. And yeah, they do, all right? She's looking at it and saying, oh, are you kidding me? You do that? Uh, and I've seen people do that in the past, okay? And the idea is it makes you sweat more, okay? Uh, it keeps the heat from evaporating and it intensifies the heat and it makes you sweat and supposedly you lose weight faster. Uh, tell you, it doesn't work that way, okay? You get it all back as soon as you start drinking. So while you lose more, it's only very temporary. But see, the guy in the movie, what was he trying to do? Um, this, this is a funny, funny movie. It's about people who are crazy, who have real deep psychological issues. And so um, he is shown just getting out of being locked up by court order for something he did when he was going through one of his episodes. And so he says he is going to turn his life around. He has a high, high purpose. His purpose is he's gonna keep himself well so that he can get his wife and he can get his career back. He's a high school teacher, so he wants to get a job, get his job back, his life back online. He wants to get his wife, whom, um, who was the cause of his going um, out of control that particular time. And, and his strategy had two parts on it. The first part is he says anything that happens bad, he's going to find the silver lining, right? You've heard of that? Every dark cloud has a silver lining behind it. And you look at a dark cloud, and the sun is out there, and it's shining, so around the edge of the dark cloud, there is that lining, right? His other strategy involves the bag. And basically, what he's doing is he's going to work on his health, and he's going to get himself strong so that he won't have any more psychotic, well, bipolar episode. And, and so this thing, he thinks, is going to work because as he sheds, he not only sheds the sweat, but he sweats out all the chemicals that the doctors have been putting into him that have kept him kind of zombie-like, okay? Now, what do you think? You think that's going to be an effective strategy? Well, this guy stays with it, and he works at it through the whole movie because he so much wants to get his wife back and to get his career back. And so it is worthwhile. He has the kind of high purpose, although he has this very weird technique. Now, 
Today's sermon, we're only going to cover four verses, but in there is one key verse. That is a key verse from Jesus' strategy, from Jesus' playbook. And I call it his solid gold playbook. Okay? And Jesus is going to give us a strategy and a solid gold. You know that because it comes from Jesus. But when you read it, it's going to sound a little bit crazy, a little bit hard to figure out. And you're going to say, how does this work? Okay? So, and, and this whole thing came about because I wanted, I said, this is Memorial Day. We should acknowledge Memorial Day. And uh, so, uh, this passage has very much a Memorial Day, kind of a spiritual Memorial Day feel for it. And so, I'm hoping with this and Memorial Day, that if you want to meditate on what Jesus is teaching in this passage through the week, it's going to be easy to come back, right? Because you're going to think of what? The garbage bag. And you're going to remember about this solid gold strategy from Jesus' playbook. The verse, let me read it to you, and then we're going to cover the whole thing. It's in verse 24 of John chapter 12. This is what Jesus says. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. If it dies, it bears much fruit. Now, in this playbook, this is not the only time that Jesus gives some very interesting strategies that make us scratch our head. Let me give you a few more of these that sound paradoxical. How many of you, word, how many of you know the word counterintuitive? Okay, you know the word counterintuitive. Uh, basically, it says, you know, it doesn't seem to make sense. It seems to go against the grain, this particular piece of good wisdom. It works, but it seems like it wouldn't work. Here are some of the other plays in Jesus' solid gold playbook. We become the greatest by becoming the least, Luke 9, 48. We lead by serving, Mark chapter 10. We find rest under a yoke, Matthew chapter 11. We are exalted by being humble, Matthew 23. We are wise, but we seem as fools for Jesus' sake. That is 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And then in 2 Corinthians 12, we are strong when we are weak. You see all these counterintuitive spiritual laws, spiritual playbook from his golden playbook. And so we're just going to look at the one from John chapter 12, verse 24 today. And let me set up the passage for you, all right? So Jesus is in his last week of life, and he is about to be sacrificed. He is going to offer himself. And as he talks about it, he talks about his death, and he says it's a good thing, it's a valuable thing, it's a necessary thing, it's a beneficial thing. And to get the point across, he uses a very familiar metaphor to an agricultural society. He talks about a seed, and he says that my death is like a seed of grain that falls into the ground, being sown and buried, this is like dying. But only by going through this kind of a process, these stages and steps, will there be a new plant and a future harvest. And then in the next verse, Jesus commends this life strategy to his followers so that they would walk in his steps. 
Okay? So that gives you the overall passage because I really want you guys to know the Bible and just not, the, not just the message. Okay, so let's go to John chapter 12. Uh, some of you guys are already there because uh, uh, the people in the back are so on the ball. And I'm going to go through the verses so that you can get the whole thing and understand it. All right, verse 23. It says this, And Jesus answered them, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. What's he talking about? His death. Does he say it in positive terms or negative terms? Very positive, right? He's talking about the glory. Okay? And now he's going to summarize his operational principle using a metaphor or an analogy. And as soon as he presents it, He's got nobody who's going to debate him. He's uh, using something that's so obviously true. Uh, and yet, Jesus wants everybody to pay attention. So he uses a Jewish form of, hey, listen up. Okay? So he says, hey, listen up. He says, truly, truly, I say to you. Okay? You can translate that as, hey, listen up. You got it? Okay, he says, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Then Jesus moves from metaphor to nitty-gritty. He tells his followers what it means to do that in their lives. Okay? And I'm going to unwrap it a little more later on. John 12, 25. Whoever loves his life loses it, Whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. You read it, and it sounds a little like garbage bag theology. What's going on? What is this about? How do I make sense of this? Okay? Verse 26. He says, And this is the payoff. If anyone serves me, he must follow me. And where I am, there will my servant be also. And if anyone serves me, what will happen? The Father will honor him. The Father will honor him. So number one, he is going to keep his life for eternal life, verse 25, and the Father will honor him. Chinese have that saying, double blessing. This is a double blessing. Okay, two parts to this. Now, last week we had Kevin. He's finished with school already. He's not just finished with the semester. And he's graduated. This is the time of graduation. Some of you might be attending graduation. One of Pat and my best friends, his son had just gone back to Berkeley to the business school to get a graduate degree. And uh, during the ceremony, his work team in his graduate class won two awards. They won the award for the best project, and they won the award for the best presentation of their project. And so you can bet he's getting so many job offers that he's been able to start refusing them already. Okay? And that's the kind of honor we want. We put in that time, and we want to have that kind of an honor. We want to get that payoff when it counts. Quite honestly, I never attended any of my graduations until I got to the one that counted. So I skipped, I skipped my junior college altogether. I skipped my college graduation. In fact, I don't even know where to find all my diplomas. They're in the garage somewhere. If there's a fire, I'm not going to go searching for it. The one that counts, okay, is the one I'm going to have to live on, my law degree. All right? So we want those ones that really count. The one that counts here is when the Father will honor us. And basically, we all want our lives to count. And if possible, we'd like each day to count, right? Each week to be worthwhile. 
It's hard to just be grungely working and not having it count. And Jesus says, this will count. Now let me go back to it. And let's look at verse 24. I'm going to unpack it a little more. It says, truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat dies, uh, I mean, falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Now, any of you guys take botany in college? I'm the only one? Okay. <laughs> I love botany, okay? Now, a seed, when it falls to the ground, what it does is the water has to penetrate so that what's called the seed coat, the hard shell, will break open so that the plant embryo can come forth, right? And so that's the thing that dies, that seed coat. Jesus will literally die, but it's really his body that dies. And the inner person will continue, and the same for us. Then verse 25, and here's the tricky part. I'm going to give it to you with the Greek so that you can understand it. Whosoever loves his life, and the Greek word for life here is suke, okay, loses it. And whoever hates his life, suke again, in this world, will keep it for eternal life. And the word for life here is zoe. Any of you guys have a friend named Zoe? Yeah, this is where it comes from, okay? So, the Greeks have three words primarily used for life. Guess what the first one is? You take this class in high school or in college. Biology, okay? So you got bios, you got suke, and you got zoe. Bios is about life and death. It's about the passage of time. Suke is our minds, our emotions, our will, namely our ego. And then zoe, you see it's tied to the word eternal life. And so it's talking about divine life. Let me read to you from James Boyce. It is the human, uh, about suke, it is the human personality that thinks plans for the future, and charts its course. It is the independent will of man. And this is what must die. This is what must be hated. And if you do, you will keep it for divine, eternal life. And again, reading from Boyce, every Christian has this eternal or divine life now, but he has it in his fullness only when his entire personality with all of its likes and desires, is surrendered to Christ. And so basically, the shell of our ego needs to be broken so that that divine life may spring forth. Let me try to come at it a different way. This is about some college students. Two engineers were stumped one from USC, the other one from UCLA. Okay? Uh, don't get mad at me if you went to USC or UCLA. Uh, they were out in a yard and they were standing by a flagpole and they were vigorously discussing a problem. Then a student from Cal Poly happened by and he asked them what they were arguing about. Oh, replied the student from USC, we were discussing how best to determine the height of this flagpole and what equation to use. That's easy, declared the Cal Poly student. And at that point, he walked into the pole and he took it out of the ground. He laid it on the grass, he pulled out his tape measure, and he said, it's 10 feet, 6 inches long. Okay? And as the student from Cal Poly walked away, the engineer from USC turned to the one from UCLA and declared, isn't that just like a guy from Cal Poly? You ask him for the height and he gives you the length. 
unorthodox, but it works, and it works even more effectively. This is the idea that's presented in verses 24 and 25, an unexpected strategy that just works. And you know, Jesus has talked about this in other places. We're going to find that actually there are many ways in which the Bible talks about it. When Jesus says, what shall it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his own soul? He's talking about the same thing, that the whole world is not enough for us to just use to feed our ego and then to lose our soul. I think of a title of a James Bond movie, The World is Not Enough. It's not enough. We're bigger than the world could satisfy. God says he put eternity in our hearts. And so we're meant for something far, far more. This principle comes out in another way. Can you think of maybe, in fact, I give you a moment, search your mind. How else the Bible talks about what we find in John 12, 24, 25, and 26? Can you think of it? Remember, we've been preaching through Mark, and Jesus said what? Take up your what? Your cross, right? You have to daily die to yourself by taking up your cross. That's one example. And that's very similar to the idea of the seed coat, the shell, dying. Here's another one. Romans, chapter 12. Present your life as a what? Yes, living sacrifice. A positive statement of it. So we have that negative statement of dying to self. We have this positive statement. And what I like about John 12 is it gives us the payoff, the double payoff, that we will have our divine life. We will keep our divine life and we will be honored by the Father. On Wednesday, I was watching, I think ESPN, sports TV, you know, sports news. And Matt Kemp was being interviewed. And he was talking about his donation, I think 250,000 or 500,000, to the Oklahoma tornado victims. And he says, you know what? I had to do it. He says, here I am, born in Oklahoma. But yesterday I heard Kevin Durant donate one million dollars. And he's not even from Oklahoma. I says, wow, that's pretty nice. Then later on I heard because of what Kevin Durant did, that the Oklahoma City Thunder team put up a million dollars. And that the NBA, National Basketball Association, put up a million dollars. Then the National Basketball Players Association put up a million dollars. Then Carrie Underwood, put up a million dollars. Then Nike put up a million dollars. See, the verse is what? You put that seed into the ground, and it dies, and it brings forth a great harvest. Now, for Kevin Durant, that one million dollars, he probably looked at it as one seed. I would have definitely looked at it as a million seeds. <laughs> <laughs> We're in a totally different tax category. Uh, but you see how it plays out. You see, even on Memorial Day, you think of these guys who had a higher purpose, who laid their lives down as a seed for the future generations of America. 
to make this a great and prosperous nation. And so it continuously happens to have our shells, our seed coats break, and then to express it as living sacrifice devotions. It's a great thing. I want us to think about that a little more, about offering our lives as living sacrifices in devotion. Do you remember the first man God called to start something new? What was his name? Come on, you're not going to get him graded. Just guess. <laughs> ah, too academic here. Abraham. He took Abraham like transplanted him from Ur of the Chaldees, took him all the way to Canaan into a rough and crazy land. And what did he do? He planted him there. And what did he promise him? You do what I ask you. And how many children will you have? How many generations will you have? Your descendants, although right now, Abraham, you are childless, they will be as the sand of the sea. They will be as the stars of the sky. One seed, then the plant, then a rich harvest. See, this is the way God has always worked. And so, the question is, how do we find ways to make our lives a living sacrifice? Today, we have in our announcements mention of at least two kinds of offerings. Oklahoma disaster relief, and then further down, Sichuan earthquake relief. Okay? Now, when the Bible talks about offerings, there's actually two words that are mentioned. One is tithe, and one is offering. You know what the difference between a tithe and an offering is? A tithe is something that you give according to how God has prospered you, and you're supposed to, according to the Bible, set it aside so you can give it regularly. Okay? And then, every once in a while, comes along an opportunity to make an offering. Oklahoma, Sichuan, any special thing. Sometimes, because you're having a birthday and you're 90 years old, you want to make an offering or something like that. Okay? But there is that regular, steady thing. To me, the concept of tithing isn't just about money. To me, personally, it means taking my whatever I can do, my time, my energy, an ability that I have to acquire. Public speaking is not natural to me, okay? Those of you who really know me know that I'm a deep introvert and I hate to be in front of people, okay? I, I have had to learn to put down fears, embarrassment, all kinds of things to do it. And not just to do it occasionally, but to teach regularly. You see, I would ask you to think about taking the talent, the ability, or an acquiring of a training so that you can regularly serve God. I'm not talking about an offering occasional service. I'm talking about a tithe of a service to a ministry. Ministries cannot be built up. Nothing can be built up by sporadic effort. The only thing that gets built up is when there is steady, consistent service, activity, growth, development. No church, no organization, no movement. So that's one thing, and it's a very 
important thing. So we talk about living sacrifice. Now let me talk about the other concept, taking up our cross and dying. Daily taking it up. What is this about? Well, here's the deal, folks. Every one of us has got issues. Okay? I used to love to shop in the old Marshalls. They've changed it. But the reason you got such great, better deals then than you do now is because Marshalls is where I went to buy irregulars. Okay? And so they had to. And sometimes you had to search forever to find out what was wrong with it, right? One little stitch in the corner. Wow, what a deal! You know, we're all just slightly irregular. That movie, Silver Linings Playbook, everybody's irregular, not just the hero and the heroine. The parents of the hero, they're irregular. The sister of the heroine, they're irregular. The city of Philadelphia, as portrayed by the Eagles fans in the movie, they were irregular. Everybody had issues. Everybody just slightly crazy. Well, maybe that's too strong a word. Irregular is good enough. Do you believe that? If you believe that, turn to someone sitting next to you and say, I'm slightly irregular. Go ahead. I mean, we are. We all got issues. We got growing needs and growing points. And this is part of that shell that keeps us from developing. And the, the, the illusion that just because we come to church, we are already, you know, past being irregular, is what keeps us from growing. Right? You be upfront about it, and you can work on it. You've got quirks, I've got quirks. Turn to your neighbor and say, you've got quirks and I've got quirks. <laughs> Some of you say, what is a quirk? That's an irregularity in your personality, okay? Um, I used to think Chinese had a strange quirk. They liked their water hot instead of cold. Now I drink hot water. <laughs> um, okay, so. Here is what God is speaking about spiritually. It's talking about dying to the flesh. Dying to the flesh in us that keeps us from growing. Let me read several passages that describe some of these things. And they're not really terrible, terrible things. Some are just irregularities. Some are just quirks. All right? Ephesians, starting at chapter 4, verse 22. Put off your old self which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires. Colossians 3.8. So that's a general statement. Colossians details it some more. But now you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, obscene talk. Do not lie to one another. Put off the old self with its practices. Galatians 5, starting at 19, and I'm going to read from the New Living Translation. Don't follow the desires of your sinful nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility. Ooh, every time I drive, I got to deal with that one. Hostility, right? I've started driving in the slow lane more and more. Control my hostility. <laughs> you get into that left lane, and I'm just a sucker for hostility if I get into lane number one. Okay? Um, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties. And it goes on. God wants these old things to be shucked and gotten rid of from our lives so that we can grow. We are all just like those people in silver mining. And you know, doing this is not that complicated. Sometimes adults, we overcomplicate it, and sometimes it takes the young to really show us the way. 
exemplify. This morning, I happened to catch on CNN, my two favorite stations, CNN, ESPN, <laughs> followed by the Cookie Channel, uh, this story about two middle schoolers, okay? Let me just kind of read it to you. Teachers and students at Highland East Junior High described the deadly tornado that destroyed their gymnasium as terrifying. For the first time, Dylan Ellis and Diane Lee were getting a first-hand look at all the destruction. The flattened building and twisted metal takes them back to the terror of Monday afternoon. The seventh grade students were in chorus. They heard the sirens and took shelter in the back of the locker room. We could hear it go boom, said Ellis. The lights go off and it's taking off this building and everyone was freaking out. Now the little girl. I started feeling myself getting lifted. The floor wasn't underneath me anymore. Ellis now, Dylan speaking. I jumped on her, put her down on the ground and had my knees on her so that she wouldn't be sucked up. Ella said, I started covering my head and holding on to the lockers. All right? One hand is on the locker and the other one covering his head while he's using himself to cover her. Flying debris fell on Dylan, but he never let go of his friend. It's the same with my brother and sister, added Ellis. I thought of her as my brother or sister. And another time he said, I thought of her as family. Classmates for only a year, but this friend, who in a moment turned hero, treated her just like family. I am really grateful that he would actually do something like that for me, said Lee. So, you know, sometimes we act. We put ourselves into that position where we are the seed planted, and we are the ones who will do the kind of sacrificial act, that great act, that is going to make such a difference. Uh, other times, we need to find ways to take our talents and invest it on a regular basis. Other times, we need to think about how and what parts of our bad shell, our seed coat, we need to be getting rid of so that all of us, the best of us, can blossom forward. And I find that the key we need is to have a big enough purpose. It's not enough to think of today. Of today. It's not enough to think about a week or a year. It's not enough to think about just even my career. The only purpose that is going to be big enough to sustain us through life is God and his kingdom. That's the kind of help we need, the kind of purpose and vision we need so that we can be in there for that whole effort so that we can do the things that seem hard, seem counterintuitive, seem so difficult, to have a purpose that is big enough. What do you think you might work on first? Would it be some aspect of that seed coat in your life that needs to be gotten rid of? Is it finding a single heroic act. Sometimes we could do more than one. At the same time I found out about Kevin Durant's million dollar donation, I saw his tattoo. Now I've never known Kevin Durant to have tattoos because most of his tattoos are hidden under his shirt. But on his back, you know what a tattoo he has? It covers his whole back. Andrew, do you know the tattoo? Have you seen it? Yeah, something, huh? 
He's got a picture of God, and he's got a picture of an angel with a basketball. <laughs> I guess he expects that there will be basketball in heaven. Okay? And then he has this whole passage from James chapter 1, verses 2 to 4. That's the verse that talks about accepting your trials so that it will make you mature. Okay? So he knows that it's not just that old donation, but also fighting through that sea coat, that shell. And here's the funny part, okay? As if God had a sense of humor when the tattoo guy was doing the word mature, the tattoo guy misspelled it. So even through the tattoo, he has to endure a trial. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? And then the last thing is, again, some ongoing way where you can serve God. Start looking for it if you haven't found it. Start trying things out so that you can find the one where you can make a difference. Okay, um, let's go ahead now and take a moment and Susie's gonna, no, she's not, she just left. She had to get ready for the other service. Just give you a moment of silence. We won't even need the piano music. And just think about it. Which, which one do you want to tackle? You think, let God speak to you. Is there some aspect of a seed coat that you need to get rid of? Is there some offering, some act of devotion? Or is there some ongoing expression of that devotion that could be a part of your life? that you'd like to try out. We're meant for so much more than just getting a college degree and finding a career. We're meant to live for far more than ourselves, far more than our peers, far more than even our parents. We're meant for the kingdom of God. Now join with me in prayer. God, I know that you treat each one of us very personally because you love each one of us so individually. And so, Lord, I pray that each person will hear your voice and to know how they may implement this wonderful strategy, this play from Jesus' golden playbook, so that we may not only succeed in this life, but we may find rewards and honor in heaven. So, Lord, speak to us. Remind us every time we see a trash bag that you have called us to greatness. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.